Monte, February 11th, 2021, Planning Board. This evening, we will be, uh, if you want to participate, you need to go uh, remotely. You have to go to the Town of Situate website and follow the directions. So uh, we're doing zoning this evening for the most part. So I will entertain a motion for to approve the agenda. A move. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Ms. Barbine. Yes. Mr. Pritchard. Yes. Ms. Lampert. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Bornstein. Yep. And Mr. McLean, just so that we know you're here. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. All, in, all in favor. Okay. All right. The first item on our agenda is a public hearing for zoning article amend section 754. Um, wait a minute. No. No. Nope. Sorry. It's um, 630. Signs. Signs. Amend section 710 signing bylaw. Okay. A notice is hereby given pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 5, that a public hearing will be held by the Situate Planning Board on Thursday, February 11, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. via remote access to consider amendments to the Situate Zoning Bylaw as described below. These amendments will appear as articles on the warrant for the annual town meeting commence, commencing April 12, 2021. All references below refer to sections of the zoning bylaw. Section 710 signs, sign definition and sign bylaw amend the zoning bylaw. Delete existing section 710 in its entirety and replace with a new section 710, which defines signs and provides for prohibited, exempt and temporary signs and provisions for them in zoning districts. The text of the current zoning bylaw and the complete text of the proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw are available for inspection during the normal hours of business of the Citrus Town Hall at the offices of the town clerk and planning board at Town Hall 600 Chief Justice Cushing Highway Situate. And on the town of Citrus website on the planning board webpage under proposed bylaw changes. Any person wishing to comment on these proposed zoning amendments should appear via remote access due to COVID-19 protocols at the public hearing at the time and date designated above. Written comments on the zoning amendments will also be accepted by the planning board prior to the public hearing. The planning board office is available at 781-545-8730 for further information. So basically, all this does, we don't regulate the content of signs. Everything else pretty much stays the same. The um, bylaw that we're getting rid of was unconstitutional. And while this particular zoning re redo of the zoning bylaw is not perfect, but it is, it's been vetted through um, a consultant that we hired to make sure that it was as it should be, and it has gone through town council. So it is what it is. And so I'll open it up to the board for discussion. Um, just a quick question on it for Karen, probably. Um, has this changed much from what we proposed at the last town meeting? No, it's, it's basically the same. A few grammatical changes from um, town council and yep. it's, it's, it's really, in all intents and purposes, the same thing. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Is there anyone uh, from the public that would wishes to comment, please? So if you're going to comment from the public, please just remember to identify yourself with your name and address. And you can participate by clicking on the bottom of your screen where it says participants, you will then be able to raise your hand. Um, and if you're participating by phone, you can hit star nine. So we will open it to public comment if there's anyone that would like to comment um, regarding the sign bylaws at this time. Okay. 
Okay. Do we have anyone? Yes. Oh. All right. Hold on one second. Hi. Sorry, I don't have my my video on it. Linda Ferguson here from Fifty Seven Kingsway. Um, I'm on the uh, advisory committee, and I'm probably going to have to write this up. So I just had a quick question on prohibited signs, um, section 710-4, and it lists a whole bunch of them. And then it says interior or illuminated signs. Does that mean signs that are inside the uh, window and illuminated, or does that mean signs that are illuminated from within the sign? <laughs> They There's are, two different things, you know. Right, what I mean? right. I do the signs that you see, and let's take into account the nail salon in North Situate has um, open, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are inside; they're on a switch. Those are fine. It's the signs that are outside that are internally lit that are okay. prohibited. So, an internally lit sign is is what this means, not interior and loose. Yes, correct. You know I mean? Yes. Okay. 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 I mean, I right. could, uh, we Does could possibly change that wording to internally, if that's, uh, that's, that's just a minor wordsmithing change, we could, um, I think we could possibly do that. Which item is it? 7.4 G. G, oh, interior illuminated signs. Yeah, I think that's, you're probably right. You, it probably needs a little wordsmithing there. Yeah. Okay. No problem. And I, and I would even say like internally lit signs that are outside the building. Cause I mean, if you do have, like I'm thinking, um, you know, like the lottery signs are, they're actually placed inside the building but they're internally lit, but they yeah. show out of the building. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. And those are okay. Right. It's plugged in, right? Right. And it can be switched off yeah. as right. opposed to those that are, outside and externally lit. What okay. comes to mind is the public safety building mm. as an internally lit sign. But because it's a municipal building, they could do it. Right. I mean, because there's also, and I know that you guys have heard about this, but the, the signs on uh, Hadley and Tilden from um, Seaside Situate are internally lit. Well, actually, they're not 100% internally lit. And we have um, technically the zoning bylaw allows them right now because it's in a residential district. Um, that's the catch there, but we have asked them to tone those down and they're way toned down at the moment. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. I didn't, like I noticed I had to go to the hotel at three in the morning one time and the glow, I was like, oh my God. And they have since been <laughs> turned down. So right, that's Because good. we yeah. tried to address the problem um, there. So we, yeah. That's fine. And I, I think that's it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Sherry, no one? Okay. I move to close the public hearing for proposed zoning amendments for section 710 signs. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Ms. Barbine. Yes. Mr. Pritchard. Yes. Ms. Lampert. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Bornstein. Yes. Thank you. All in favor, unanimous. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is. Wait, we can't start the next public hearing till 745. I mean, 645. 645. Okay. All right. So do we have any minutes to approve? Well, hold on, I need to get them. I do. Um, hold on. I move to approve the meeting minutes for January 28, 2021. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Ms. Barbine. Yes. Mr. Pritchard. Yes. Ms. Lampert. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Bornstein. Yes. Thank you, uh, unanimous, all in favor. And I move to approve the requisition of $131.04 to the Gatehouse Media for 418 Country Way Legal Ad 
for $1,797 to Horsley written for the peer review of Seaside and Citroën Phase 2, for $1,450 to Chester Consulting for a peer review of 48-52 New Driftway Gas Backwards. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Ms. Barbine. Yes. Mr. Pritchard. Yes. Ms. Lampert. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Bornstein. Yes. Thank you. Unanimous all in favor. Okay. Uh, let's see. Liaison reports. Uh, I met with CPC the other night. Uh, we're still talking about purchasing the property on Chief Justice Cushing Highway. So there was some discussion about it, but we are putting it off until the board can, the um, CPC can, can discuss the uh, appraisal, which came in the day of or the day before our, our meeting. So that's happening, or hopefully will be happening. Um, we deep sixed, for lack of a better description, redoing the stone wall on uh, um, Country Way opposite the Merritt property. We also decided not to fund the steps leading down to the beach in North Situate. We put on hold nourishing North Situate Beach until Sean McCarthy gets more information about grants, et cetera. We put on um, till the next meeting, the um, Herringbrook Berm, because that's where uh, Penny Pipes wants to put bridges, and, but we need to do the engineering and that it could be a lot more expensive than the $45,000 that she's talking about. And those two bridges could potentially cost upwards of $200,000. So that's been pu pushed off until our next meeting in um, March. So that's all I know about that. Anybody else? Um, Master Plan Advisory Committee met um, last night to go over kind of the, the latest round of comments with our consultant. Um, and we kind of unanimously decided that we're gonna be tabling the um, town meeting endorsement of the master plan until next fall, but that we're going to forge ahead to get this presented to the planning board this spring and hopefully approved by the planning board before our contract with our consultant is up in June. Um, so look for a lot of movement in the next you know, few months on the master plan. Uh, Emily, the, the consultant is trying to kind of com compile all of the edits and changes right now. And I think she should have that back to us sometime in the next week or two. And then um, we'll be setting next steps from there. But the next step will be uh, coming to the planning board for, for our review and, uh, and, and public comment. So that's kind of where we are with that. Okay. Uh, Rebecca, do you have anything? No, I was not able to attend um, the meetings I was going to, supposed to go to, so no. Okay. All right. Um, we are now at the point that it is six, just about 645. So we have um, notices hereby given pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 5, that a public hearing will be held by the Situate Planning Board on Thursday, February 11th, 2021 at 6.45 p.m. via remote access to consider amendments to the Situate Zoning Bylaws as described below. These amendments will appear as articles on the warrant for the annual town meeting commencing April 12, 2021. All references below refer to sections of the zoning bylaw. Section five, 754, fair housing and affordable standards. Amend section 754, fair housing and affordability standards. So it applies to more than five units in all districts with the requirement that land under common ownership for housing developments cannot be segmented to avoid this requirement. 
the text of the current zoning bylaw and the complete text of the proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw are available for inspection during the normal hours of business of the Situate Town Hall at the offices of the town clerk and the planning board at Town Hall, 600 Chief Justice Cushing Highway, Situate, Massachusetts, and on the Town of Situate website on the planning board webpage under proposed bylaw changes. Any person wishing to comment on these proposed zoning amendments should appear via remote access due to COVID-19 protocols at the public hearing at the time and date designated above. Written comments on the zoning amendments will also be accepted by the planning board prior to the public hearing. The planning board office is available at 781-545-8730 for further information. Okay, um, Karen, would you like to begin, please? All right, so the planning board asked to uh, put together a bylaw for inclusionary zoning as it was recommended to be incorporated in the 2015 and the 2020 housing production plans. Um, we've always had some type of um, inclusion in the village business overlay district for affordable units. And now the board um, wants to expand it to include all developments with five, um, so five or fewer units would not need affordable units. So starting with six units, you would need to have affordable housing. Um, situate subsidized housing inventory is currently at 5.1% where 10% affordable housing is um, the mandate from the state. So the board thought that they um, would expand um, Try to expand so that inclusionary zoning applied to more zoning districts and to more more development. Okay. It currently applies to several of our development areas. Okay. All right, um, Patty. Do you want to speak to this? Um, no, I've done some research and. Um, Taking, taking off of the advisory board that we need to make sure that it's affordable for developers. Uh, my personal opinion is that is not the purview of the planning board. Our purview is to make sure that we have affordable housing for everyone. Um, lots of research shows that um, it does not have a detrimental effect on development. It is about 1%. And in a unit, uh, five or more units, they tend to spread that cost out across the rest of the um, development. I do believe that we have seen a huge gentrification of Situate. Um, we know by looking at the paper, affordability is a, a, a tangible, a non-tangible um, goal for a lot of people. And um, I do not feel that my position on the plate of can support that we do not allow all kinds of people to live here. Ben? Um. I mean, I, I agree with Patty also just more broadly, I'd say that I think this is a very important um, and good revision to the existing bylaw. Um, you know, the, the real, you know, from our, from our housing production plan as well as our previous master plan and the not yet approved um, current master plan, you know, everything points towards the fact that we need to beef up our affordable housing. And I think as a planning board, we should really move on this because the goal is to have an inclusive community here that provides you know, a variety of housing types. And, and, and also very importantly, to try to meet the state mandate because as we know, 40 Bs are, um, you know, this town has a lot of pressure from 40 Bs and anything we can do to try to work towards not only achieving the you know, goals of our community uh, of having an inclusive community, but also getting away from the 40B element is um, is really a win for for us uh, in terms of town planning. So I, I think that it's a, uh, the revisions are, are good. I think they're fair compared to what uh, we've looked at in other communities. And uh, I think it, it should be supported and will be supported by, by a lot of people in town. Rebecca? And I think Patty and um, Ben have pretty much said everything, so I'm good. Okay. 
Bob? Uh, I'm okay. All right. With uh, nothing further to add. All right. Steve? Uh, I, I generally agree with Ben on this that, um, you know, that, that we should be making steps towards this. I think we should recognize that this is a somewhat small incremental step, but it's, it's worth moving, trying to move the needle forward. Um, but the affordable housing issue is a, is a much bigger issue than, than, you know, changing the, the target here by a couple of, you know, um, uh, individual units that, that trigger, you know, providing, providing one unit of affordable housing, but um, this will help, I think, move us in that direction, but I don't think it's going to make a material impact on, you know, sort of staving off 40B um, type, uh, type facilities. We just have such a long way to go, and we're going to need to take bigger chunks to do that, but it, on the whole, I don't think it's it's making um, too much of a uh, you know burden on development, and you know given that um, there seems to be um, plenty of sort of examples in and around the area where this is the target that uh, I don't see why we can't uh, support that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll open it up to the public for comment, please. So if there's anyone that would like to comment from the public, please um, remember to state your name and your address. And you can participate by uh, clicking on the bottom of your screen where it says participants and then raising your hand. If you're on the line by phone, you can hit star nine. So we will open it up to public comment. Hi, hi everybody. Mark Fenton, 25 Crescent Avenue. Um, Thank you for your continued work on this. Um, I did a little research also since your last meeting on this at, at, at the suggestion of the board based on some of the discussion that was happening. And a couple of things, I'll, I'll first remind everybody that this aligns with a priority way back in the last version of the master plan. And as we've been going through the update to the master planning process, I'm on the advisory group there, uh, clearly housing continues to be a high priority. So this mirrors what, uh, Ms. Lambert, Mr. Bornstein said that that you know any in improvement we can make uh, on on affordability in housing is is really important. And this moves from an incentive-based program, sort of density bonuses and things like that, or only in restricted areas, to include all of town. So that that's not an insubstantial step forward in in the comprehensiveness of the effort to get more affordable housing. Although I agree with Mr. Pritchard that it's it's one step of what should be a greater program. And indeed, some of my research suggests. That, that the best inclusionary programs are parts of a more comprehensive approach to affordability. They don't stand alone. So that's a good recommendation to us as a town to think about what else we can do. And as much as there are concerns about them, the two things you hear most often is that they either cause reduced production, that is now people can't afford, you know, developers can't afford to develop and therefore you actually see housing production go down or increase prices. Um, and the evidence from occasional case studies are used to make that point, but if you look at the broader research that does really qualified research on this, it suggests that tends not to happen. And in fact, there are attributes of successful programs that tend to preclude those problems, naming, in, namely increased price and or decreased housing production. One is that inclusionary policies seem to work best where there are strong housing markets. That is, there's already demand and housing prices are solid and, and not wavering. We clearly don't, you know, don't have an issue with a weak housing market here. Mandatory programs are better than voluntary programs. So that's, and that's precisely what this is. It is saying as a matter of course, it will always be required above a certain trigger sized development. And, and third, predictability is really important. In other words, once it's put into bylaw and developers have a clear picture of what's expected and when the requirement's gonna kick in, they can just adjust their calculations accordingly. Um, uh, not knowing is the worst thing for a developer. So predictability by therefore, therefore by making it part of the, the bylaw rather than part of a negotiated process or something like that, much better. Um, Last thing is you do see some evidence around some discussion of, uh, for example, allowing a fee in lieu approach, which is to say you have this bylaw, but then you allow 
developers to instead pay money into a affordable housing fund or something like that. Um, and I would suggest my reading of that says it's, it's risky business because what happens is the money goes into a fund and maybe it gets applied to affordable housing in a timely manner, maybe it doesn't. Um, and it, you can end up with clustered affordable housing. One of the goals of this ordinance suggests that your affordable housing is distributed. You get more heterogeneity of your housing market versus creating clumps of affordability uh, in one place or, or uh, which uh, is, is not a very, um, certainly not a very egalitarian way to go. So I think uh, my, my, my points to the board would be, you've, it looks like you're following best practice based on the evidence I've been able to dig up even since when we last talked. And it's certainly a need. And there's my experience with the work on the update to the master plan says there's great, great desire in the community to see at least some progress made here. And I think this is a great way to do it. So I commend the board for your work on this. And, and I'd just like to you know, testify strongly in support of this. And we'll be happy to do so at town meeting as well. Thank you, Mark. Um, well said. Anybody else, please? please? I just want to say thanks to Mark for doing that additional research too. That, that was quite helpful. So thank you. Is there anyone else from the public? All right, um, Karen. All right, so I had a conversation with town council today about the, um, the new housing initiatives that have come out in the past week from uh, Department of Housing and Community Development. And she advised uh, me to have the planning board continue this public hearing tonight so that in the next two weeks, we can really look at the impacts of this, um, of this new housing directive on, on this proposed bylaw and the proposed bylaw for North Situate. So that's my recommendation to the board that you continue this so we can, we can talk about the housing initiative, which we haven't even talked about yet as a board. Just to let you know that most of this information has come out just this particular week. As a matter of fact, there was an article in the Globe business section on Tuesday talking about housing choice. And it's something that has um, been pushed through by Governor Baker. So that's something that we will be talking about. Um, it's really applicable to our next um, zoning article for North Situate. So that said, I move to continue the public hearing for the proposed zoning amendments for section 754, fair housing and affordability standards to Thursday, February 25, uh, 2021 at 715. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Ms. Barbine. Yes. Mr. Pritchard. Yes. Ms. Lampart. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Bornstein. Yes. Thank you, unanimous, all in favor. Okay. All right, now we move on to public hearing on North Situate. Notice is hereby given pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 5, that a public hearing will be held by the Situate Planning Board on Thursday, February 11th, 2021 at 7 p.m. via remote access to consider amendments to the Situate Zoning Bylaw as described below. These amendments will appear as articles on the warrant for the annual town meeting commencing April 12th, 2021. The intent of the changes is to add a new village center and neighborhood district, VCN, in North Situate and do some housekeeping to delete sections previously changed by adding a VCN and to make the VCN bylaw more user-friendly. All references below refer to sections of the zoning bylaw. One, amend all sections, change all references throughout the bylaw accordingly from general business, GB, to district, to business, B. Two, amend all sections, remove Harvard business, which is HB, commercial C, and residential multifamily districts throughout the bylaw accordingly. Three, amend all sections, change board of selectmen throughout, and replace with select board throughout the bylaw accordingly. 
four, section 200 definitions, amend definition of cottage court, delete number of bedrooms. Five, section 310 types of districts, add a new village center and neighborhood district to include North Situate Village and its sub-districts. Six, section 320 location of districts, clarify location of districts map by adding current, current zoning map date of April 8th, 2019 and add previously approved Hamarok Village Overlay Business District November 5th, 2019 and add North Situate Village Center and Neighborhood District and its sub-districts. Seven, section 420 table of use regulations. Amend the table to include titles of the districts for the village center and neighborhood district by adding a title Greenbush Dif Driftway Gateway District to the table and add North Situate Village and its sub-districts and uses to the table of uses. Eight, section 490 plan development district, delete section 490 plan development district in its entirety as it was previously pre replaced annual town meeting, April 9th, 2019, uh, special town meeting, November, 2019, with the village center and neighborhood district, Greenbush Driftway Gateway District. Nine, section 560 village business overlay district, remove all references to North Situate as a village business overlay district and its boundaries, uses and requirements. 10, amend section 580, add North Situate Village and its sub-districts as a new village center and neighborhood district, VCN, with requirements and design and development standards. Update Greenbush Driftway allowed building types in the VCN district in table one and table two and delete the maximum dwelling units per building under bulk standards. 11, section 720 common driveways. Correct standards of review listed in 720.1 from sections 770.5 and 770.6. 12, section 750 design review for business, commercial, mixed use and multifamily development reorganized to make more user friendly by separating design standards and design guidelines and adding a new North Situate VCN to be added including included in the building types and design standards and building activation encroachments. Delete ordinances in figure 12, building activation encroachments and replace with bylaws. Section 13, no, 13, section 751, low impact development standards, amend section 751.3, B4 to add as applicable for use of native landscaping and delete the excess words, the maximum in section 751.3 H1. 14, section 753 public realm standards update table one, public realm design standards to clarify street width components and sidewalk components. 15, amend section 750. 54 fair housing and affordable standards delete sentence on bedrooms in section 754.6 16 amend section 760 parking clarify parking to so, parking to so that use of table one and table two is clarified in update table two for restaurant use and delete place of assembly in table two the text of the current zoning bylaw and the complete text of the proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw are available for inspection during the normal hours of business in the Situate Town Hall at the offices of the town clerk and the planning board at Town Hall, 600 Chief Justice Cushing Highway, Situate, Massachusetts, and on the Town of Situate website on the, uh, on the planning board web page under proposed bylaw changes. Any person wishing to comment on these proposed zoning amendments should appear via remote access due to COVID-19 protocols. At the public hearing at the time and date designated above, written comments on the zoning amendments will also be accepted by the planning board prior to the public hearing. The planning board office is available at 781-545-8730 for further information. Okay, um, Karen, is Chris with us tonight or no? 
Chris is with us tonight. All right. Okay. So why don't we hear from Chris concerning what we're doing here? Chris, okay. you're on. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, the presentation I have, which I'm going to share my screen right now, is essentially the same one that I, I gave last month at the public hearing. Um, I'm sorry, the public workshop hosted by the planning board. So if if you'd like for me to kind of abbreviate this, um, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to kind of carry on. Um, with, with carry on. Okay. So let's see. Okay. So let me just start off. Um, what are we actually doing here? Um, you know, obviously a lot's going on based upon what um, what was just read. Um, but the main crux of this is to rezone the North Situate Village. Um, area and to bring it under as part of the, the town's um, village center neighborhood um, zoning district um, form based code framework. Obviously, um, for everyone who knows North Situate, the kind of the big issue that that's been kind of holding back and hampering development is the lack of sewer. Uh, the zoning is not going to solve that. But I think what the town's kind of thought was in, in advance of sewer coming before sort of um, that happens, which will probably lead to sort of the floodgates opening um, for lots of um, interest and proposals for development. There's the opportunity now for the town to actually get the regulations in place so that it ensures that any future proposals come in will be sort of um, comporting with the, with the vision that the town has has developed and, and in large part really just ensuring that development sort of fits with this area which is that of a kind of a classic new england village um, this zoning will expand options for the landowners um, and then as was also mentioned um, as we went through this process um, we noticed some is a number of issues as it related to the BCN. So even though that wasn't kind of the, the core part of what the um, what we were hired to do, we started expanding um, kind of the scope of it to kind of address those issues, um, especially for the BCN. And then we also found other issues that Karen and I spoke about um, in other parts of the bylaw. So we were able to kind of clean it up. So this process, um, it, it's going to end up being about a two-year process, um, and actually it even traces um, itself earlier to that by a few years um, where the town hired a consultant to develop a, a vision for the North Situate area um, that was done. Um, and, and then there was sort of um, a little kind of few period, few years period, um, and then the town started working with MAPC to actually help um, and, and develop the zoning. Um, so this kicked off in the spring of 2019. And we, um, for those who were there, we, we had a very well attended forum. Um, there were a lot of people there. So that we're able to introduce the project and, and get a lot of um, great feedback. Um, this was originally intended to be a one year process, um, but Brad, the, um, the planning director, he, he, he left and then COVID hit. And so everything sort of got delayed for a while and we're able to sort of pick this back up in, in the fall. Um, kind of the one benefit to that though is, it, um, as you can see from this um, list on this slide, we've had lots of opportunities to bring this to, to the public and to various stakeholders to um, kind of help in, um, refine this, this zoning bylaw. Um, so just a couple of facts about the, the study area. Oops, sorry. Um, the total area of the district is about 36 acres, um, which I think is, is fairly typical for um, kind of a village in, in this kind of context. Um, it's spread over about 49 parcels. Um, the density of the area as measured by floor area ratio is, is extremely low, I would say, um, at, at 0 0.09. Um, that, that's partially due to the fact that there are parking lots um, for commuters um, that, that kind of lower that. But also, I think it is, generally speaking, a bit of um, sort of an underutilized area. Um, and of course, as we noted, um, sewer, the lack of sewer is one of those kind of big limiting factors there. The other thing I just want to note, note here is um, the daily station boardings. This was pre-COVID, but um, at 335 daily boardings, it's, I would say, quite high. And to me, that sort of speaks to the fact that given the opportunity, there would be a lot of people that would really kind of find it desirable to live in this area and, and walk to the station 
and take the train to work downtown and then come back and then they would sort of be in this walkable neighborhood where they can do their errands and pick up the dry cleaning, go to a restaurant, et cetera. So I, I think there's a really great potential in this area for, for sort of a suburban transit oriented development. Um, we kind of drew as from the zoning, our inspiration from that previous visioning report. Um, and this is sort of summarizes um, what that kind of vision general goal was for this area. And it's essentially just to, to grow into a vibrant, um, active neighborhood center um, through re redevelopment of properties and public um, realm improvements. Um, as part of the process, we kind of looked at what's kind of the existing and then, you know, sort of what are some examples of how this could look um, under sort of the future. Um, and so just a couple examples kind of out in sort of more of the outer parts of this district, um, the kind of the vision includes things like new housing types like cottage clusters. Um, and then sort of in the more where the main intersection is um, there, that would be more sort of a commercial mixed use area. Um, and again, all of this would be sort of focusing on the kind of classic New England village principles. Um, I'll go through a little bit of the public input that we got. Um, a lot of this, as I mentioned, came from that very first forum that, that was very well attended. Um, as part of that forum, what we did was um, we did some live polling that we were able to do, um, which was kind of fortunate because since we had so many more people than we expected, this was um, something that could kind of scale up very easily. Um, so a few of the questions we asked, uh, one of them was, should all future build buildings in this area um, sort of have the, the traditional New England village patterns, and, and we discussed what that was. Um, and you can see 89% um, either agreed or strongly agreed with this sentiment. So it was sort of overwhelming that people agreed with that. We also asked about, my slides are not advancing, so there we go. Um, housing, and, and should this be an opportunity for the town, this kind of maybe um, kind of piggies back on, on the previous discussion about your um, inclusionary zoning. Um, is this an opportunity to um, diversify the types of housing um, within the, this area? Um, and again, um, you know, you had a, a very high percentage, 84% either agreed or strongly agreed with that sentiment. And then we also asked, we showed a number of pictures of different building types. And so I'm just gonna show you a couple of when we asked for a visual preference sort of what people like for development. Um, so this example and this example, both of them um, people, it was 94% either liked it or loved these buildings. Um, and so that helps us think about the scale, the style, the roof lines, the architecture, um, where the building is sort of situated on the site, how it's kind of brought up right to the sidewalk. Um, and so that, that all informed the zoning. So we'll get into the zoning a little bit now. Um, as I mentioned, um, this will become part of the town's village center neighborhood um, framework. Um, that was adopted a couple years ago at a town meeting. And, and it basically provides a framework for the town's various villages. So when it was adopted, it included the Greenbush neighborhood um, and now North Situate would be the next neighborhood to kind of come under this umbrella. Um, and, and the intent of the VCN is, is to essentially to promote um, context sensitive development um, and provide these overarching standards while still allowing each village then to have sort of the nuance so that it can develop in a way that is appropriate for each village. Um, and one of the other kind of, I think, innovative aspects to this zoning framework is that it also allows for the creation of sub-districts within the village. So different parts of the village can, can also be different from each other. Um, this type of zoning is what's called a form-based code. And form-based code puts a greater emphasis on the actual building design, the form of the building and its interaction with the public realm than traditional zoning does, um, while also still, you know, this still includes things about uses. Um, but here we're looking at not just uses, but also actual types of buildings that are allowed. Um, some pretty specific design standards that are required, as well as some of the more traditional things we find in, in zoning bylaws, like the parking requirements and open space requirements, et cetera. Um, so this map is something I think we can come back to um, and refer to this as needed in, in the question component, but this shows the um, boundaries of the district. Um, so we're proposing two districts, um, the, the gray we're calling the village center, 
the purple, which is two non-contiguous parts, is the um, outer village. And I'll explain a little bit in terms of kind of the different characters of, of these two areas. Um, there was some questions that have come up um, in terms of how do we come up with these boundaries for the districts, um, both the overall district as well as sort of within the district, the sub-districts, how do we come up with like where the lines were drawn. Um, and so I, in terms of the overall boundaries, it, it essentially followed for the most part the existing commercial district. Um, the one change that we made that Karen and I discussed that we thought made sense was there were some parcels where some parcels actually were in two districts. It was partially in the commercial and partially not. And so we simplified things by having those parcels be all within the, um, within the um, North Situate Village subdistrict. In terms of how we kind of drew the line between the, the gray and the purple, um, this is a little bit of an art, to be honest, and, and it was developed um, back with, when Brad, the planning director, was um, involved. Um, but it, it essentially comes down to the different characters that are in these different parts of the village. And I just grabbed some pictures just to kind of point out. So these are some pictures from the village um, center. And, and you can see, I, I don't want to use the term urban because I don't think that's the right term, but they, they are sort of denser area for the most part where buildings are either touching or very close to each other. In many cases, the buildings are right up against the sidewalk. And I think that's just a little bit different from in the outer area um, where buildings tend to be further apart. Um, there tends to be a little more um, either, either pavement or um, kind of greenery that accommodates a lot more open space that is there. So th that's kind of the different characters that, that were there. Um, in terms of uses, um, just in general, I would say, you know, the, the intent, what we tried to do is to be as flexible as possible to allow a wide sort of array of uses that were all compatible with kind of becoming a, being a walkable and mixed use district. The village center, so the gray part, that has more restrictions than the outer village. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, one of the things that we heard that came through very loud and clear from the feedback was, we want to ensure that this North Situate remains a commercial village. And there were fears of residential development displacing commercial development. And so we wanted to kind of put restrictions on to ensure that that um, doesn't happen. Um, I also would just to note that the existing uses are grandfathered in under the new zoning. Um, and as I mentioned before, because this is a form-based code, you have to comply with both the uses and the form of the building. So in the village center, there are three types of buildings that are allowed. Mixed use buildings, um, which mean ground floor, commercial, um, and generally residential above, but it could be office. Uh, commercial only buildings and, and live work buildings are essentially a type of mixed use building that's in, in the um, kind of BCN framework. Within the outer village, this is where we're sort of relaxing things and we're allowing some additional types of residential um, development. And, and I think this is important um, for one reason, um, requiring commercial throughout everywhere, I think um, from a market demand standpoint would be difficult and, and we don't wanna sort of have vacancies, which is um, also not a, a sort of, would not contribute to sort of a vibrant neighborhood. But also when you have this area to, with people living, these are people who are going to be supporting the, the businesses. So I think it can create this sort of virtuous cycle. So all the same types of buildings are allowed that were in the village center. In addition, there are allow um, cottage clusters, which are kind of small homes that are close together, um, townhome style buildings, multifamily buildings, um, as well as the gas backwards style building, which is um, just kind of inverts the, the site plan of a um, gas station to make it um, more walkable. Sorry, my slides are freezing, it seems. There we go, sorry. Um, okay, so this is one thing that I did wanna kind of pause a little bit more than last time because this relates to this issue um, that Karen was talking about um, with these new regulations. So um, my understanding is this is the first time in 45 years that the state has actually <laughs> updated its zoning, um, zoning laws in chapter 40A. Um, and so it made a number of changes. Um, the good news is most of the changes or most of what we're proposing in North Situate is already going to be um, 
what the law um, sort of is going to require, the state laws will require. But there is one aspect that where we're falling a little bit short right now. So the, the requirements are from this new legislation require all communities that are served by transit to have at least one district within the town that allows multifamily and mixed use by right. Um, so from that perspective, we're, we're accomplishing that because we do here in North Situate. What we're missing though is the requirement is that that uh, by right multifamily and mixed use has to be at 15 units per acre. So what we had developed prior to knowing about this brand new legislation was we had put 12 units per acre because we were matching what was done in Greenbush. My recommendation to the board, and I'm happy to talk about this, would be to change what we're proposing in North Situate from 12 units by right to 15 units by right. Um, it already, the proposal would allow 24 units by special permit. So we're only going, we're only changing the by right by what I would consider a small amount. Um, if, if this was a type of situation where we had very large parcels, like if you had a 10 acre parcel, then you could go from 120 units to 150 units. That then that might be a more substantial impact. Here in North Situate, we're talking about mostly very small parcels. Most of them are less than one acre. Even if you have an acre large parcel, in my opinion, going from 12 units to 15 units by right it is not going to have a major impact. Um, and I think this is a nice opportunity before this goes to town meeting for, for North Situate to kind of just be in compliance with what the state will require, um, because most communities are going to be playing catch up, to be honest with this. Um, so I'll, you know, again, I'm happy to talk about that as, as you know, at any point. Um, I think the only other thing I just wanted to kind of mention, we did make some modifications from the overall um, VCN framework that's specific to North Situate that better reflects what we saw from the visual preference survey. Um, we can obviously talk about those um, if desired. And then the other thing we did was we made a number of changes um, to kind of mostly just cleaning up and, and um, clarifying various ambiguities um, as it related to the VCN. I'm um, just like, as one example, um, there was some confusion between what is a required design standard versus what is an advisory design guideline. So we reformatted things to, to clarify that. We also clarified that the board can waive most design standards, but there are some things that you can't waive, um, like height, for example. Um, we, we fixed, again, ambiguity as related to parking requirements, and we made some other cleanups. Um, and then in terms of the other parts of the bylaw that was kind of all listed at the beginning where we just were, were deleting various references and, and just cleaning it up that I think overall will hopefully make the bylaw um, more user-friendly. So yeah, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, first of all, I have to say, just to let you all know that I do have a business in North Situate, the new upholstery shop, and I have been there for 30 years. And I have seen businesses come and I have seen businesses go. And North Situate, I do not have a monetary interest in anything that may happen down the road. My concern is for the town and what is in the best interest in particular for North Situate. The zoning needs to be dealt with. It needs to be dealt with very well and it needs to be vetted. And you, this has been an ongoing process that while I have been involved with the planning board for a good number of years, this has been going on for a very long time. And I have also felt rightly or wrongly so that North Situate has been sort of the poor relative. You know, other parts of town were taken care of or updated or whatever with the idea that there'd be no competition for the harbor. Well, excuse me, we are a viable, wonderful place to be. And with these changes, whether sewer comes or whether it doesn't, it will enable necessary growth, necessary changes that will work, hopefully, for the future. And that's what we're talking about here. It's the future. 
And yes, I understand that it is not perfect. I understand that there are some that want, you know, a parcel here or a parcel there deleted. And I'm not sure that that makes a lot of sense. So that said, I will open this up first to the board and then to the public. If you have any questions for Chris, feel free to ask. Okay, um, Rebecca. Um, I don't have any questions at this time, Chris, but nice job presenting that. Um, I thought it was very thorough and I got a great understanding of what um, is going on. So thank you very much for that. Okay, Ben. Um, I don't have any questions. I think that um, Chris and the folks at MAPC in conjunction with the, the town you know, planning department did a great job pulling this bylaw together. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a strong bylaw and I think it's what, what's needed to kind of chart a course for the future of North Situate. Um, and uh, I think generally it hits all the marks that, that uh, we as, you know, as a board or for me myself, would, would want to see there. So um, I'm in support of it and good job. Okay, um, Bob. Chris, I just had uh, one question. What are the names of the uh, the two building styles? Uh, do you have any name for them or, or do they represent any particular architectural period um, of the two building styles that uh, received the most support? Yeah. I. <laughs> I'm not an architect, so there probably is a name that I'm not sure. I, I just, that's why I'm kind of referring to it more generally as kind of a traditional New England style, um, at least because of the principles that it involves, like the, the roof line, for example. Um, but I, I, I'm sorry, I can, could probably find out if you're really curious, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, thanks. Sorry. All right, Steve? Um, I, I'm generally in favor of this. I think this is um, sort of a, a transition from the from the Greenbush area that we uh, that we laid out, and it seems appropriate that we do a similar sort of planning exercise for North Situate as well. And and it seems to have adopted pretty much the same approach. And given that that's the other train station, I I think it's appropriate. Um, I don't I don't. Um, really have uh, an opinion on the on the density of units um, but um, to the extent that uh, um, you know increasing the the number of units is consistent with uh, new zoning laws then um, you know I'm certainly willing to listen to that okay Patty I agree with all of you above type of what situation shine her little light mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, um, Karen, do you have anything you want to add before I open this up to the public? Yeah, I just want to um, just, you know, the board will discuss this um, a little bit later tonight, but this new um, section of Chapter 40A provides that each MBTA community shall have a zoning ordinance or by or bylaw that provides for at least one district of reasonable size in which multifamily housing is permitted as of right. And so ultimately the question for the board is going to be, do we want to, as Chris said, just jump it to 50, you have to be have 15 units per acre to jump it to 15 units right now for North Situate. And is North Situate the district that you want this to be in? We have two VCN districts with multifamily housing that is allowed. Um, so those are the questions the board needs to think about as we um, go through this hearing. And again, town council has advised that we continue this hearing tonight um, so we can delve into the fine points of what's required um, of this new directive and just have two more weeks to do it since this directive has just come out, you know, in the past week. All right, thank you, Karen. Um, I'll open it up now. I have a question on that just, just quickly. The, the uh, development at Greenbush, does that, does that sort of meet the uh, density requirements? No, it doesn't. You have the same density in Greenbush 
at 12 units per acre in uh -huh. 24 max. So it's the same issue. It would be the same issue in Greenbush that we would have to increase the density, but we would have to do that. Um, we'd have to we'd have to probably do that at the fall town meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll open this up to the public. So, I've, mm -hmm. oh, all righty. You good, Sherry? No. Susanna, there you go. Yeah. Just remember to, to identify yourself with your name and address, please. Yes. I'm Susanna Hofmeister for Jason's Lane, North City. Um, thank you so much for all the hard work you're doing. I really love the rezoning in North City Village, and I had the opportunity to take part in all these uh, forums and surveys, and I really like that we can have some input. I also represent tonight the EDC and the Friends of North City Village, and I want to say that um, we believe that the proposed changes are critical to revitalization of North City Village after sewer comes for the development, and um, I have one question. The 15 units per acre, if we um, have, have these uh, density, does that make the building higher? Because I think we said that the buildings cannot be higher than three stories. So if we now allow more units per acre, does that have any impact on the building heights? No, um, it would not. Um, and I think that's actually one of the one of the reasons why I think the, the actual practical effect of going from 12 to 15 units per acre on such small parcels is that given height requirements, um, parking requirements, you know, open space, whatever there it is, I actually don't think you, you, in many cases you'll get to the 15 anyway in, in most cases. Um, but, but to directly answer your question, no, it would not supersede other parts. It, it's basically an allowance to be up to that if you can get there. <laughs> That, that's what I think. And I have, I have one more question. Um, I did comment on the on the zoning um, um, bylaws uh, when, when you were asking for input. And um, I asked that I like the buildings to be set back so that you have open space in front for allowing to have tables and, you know, um, outdoor dining or even strolling wider uh, walkways to stroll through North City at Village, because mm -hmm. I think we are in competition to Cohasset Village, you know, and other villages which have a lot of outdoor dining space. And I really would like to see that whatever is planned as from a developer side, uh, that these buildings are set back and we have the, the space up front, because if the um, business changes from a retailer to a um, restaurant later, you know, like, in five or 10 years, we have the space up front to allow this. And I think that would be really, really uh, important for the future of North City Village. Yes, and it does. Um, so we, we did, so I, I should have pointed this out on that map, um, but there's sort of this um, dashed kind of reddish line and, and that where that is, those are, that's called the pedestrian frontage zone area. Um, and that's again, all defined within the BCN that already exists and, and part of those requirements is for that sort of um, ground level activation through the through the public seating. Um, so you, you couldn't park a car in your front yard setback, but yeah. you, you can have the seating. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next. You ready for me, Shari? Uh, hi, I'm Aaron Cutler. Uh, I live in North Situate on Mordecai Lincoln, and I have a piece of property, the old Hingham Institution for Savings Bank at 400 Gannett. So we're right, I'm right in the middle of this whole situation. Uh, I think the, uh, the plans look great. Um, I've followed this kind of the whole way through, and I think you guys have done a really, really good job. Um, I, I've made a comment in the past, and I know it can't really be addressed by the plans, but that at least on the kind of from country way down to Mordecai Lincoln on that little stretch there, it's going to be very difficult for redevelopment if we don't have some kind of parking solution. So 
I just um, I hope in the future we'll be able to address that somehow. But overall, love the plans and uh, nice job. Thank you. Thank you for all the comments you've given throughout the process. Thank you. Anyone else? Yep. Mark. Well, Oh, sorry, thanks, Sherry. Mark Fenton, 25 Crescent. Um, I just want to agree uh, with Ms. Burbine's first comments, which she says, this is a forward looking zoning and you guys have done great work on it. I, I have to say from my work around the country, people are using form-based codes and or hybrid form-based codes. Chris, you've done terrific work on this. It's really commendable. Um, and, and you're right to be getting ahead of, of sewer, have this in place beforehand. Uh, and it's, it's the perfect location for it. And, and I think, even the step down, you know, from the, you know, acknowledging those two, the inner, the center uh, village zone versus that, that outer village is, is a really good way to address that, that concern about uh, residential pushing out commercial. So just want to commend the board for good work and, and say that I think this is really the future. This is where people are going with these form-based approaches. Um, so uh, I'm very excited to see it. And, and I, I, one bit of clarification, but I think Chris, you just said that those setbacks quite specifically, the ordinance does not allow for parking in that space between street edge and building front, right? That's actually, yes, great. it does. Cool. Okay. Yep. I, I thought you guys had already written that in, but I just want to make sure. Great. Thank you. Well <laughs> done. Kudos. Kudos to yeah. everybody involved. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else, Sherry? I don't see any other questions. Okay. All right. Um, on the advice of town council, we have to continue this public hearing. So I move to continue the public hearing from proposed zoning amendments for North Situate VCN and VCN housekeeping to Thursday, February 25, 2021 at 7.15 PM. Is there a second? Second. I'll, and before we move on, Chris, I cannot thank you enough for what you have done. You have been tremendous. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Ms. Burbine. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Yes. Ms. Lampert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you, unanimous, all in favor. All right. Thank you all for your hard work, for your participation. It is about the future, and it's important that we get it right. And I think that we're doing a good job. All right, whose dog is that? <laughs> ah, well, okay. Thank you all. And we're going to um, our next item on the agenda is a discussion vote for historical preservation policy. So somewhere in this, we have historic preservation. Somewhere. I had it. Oh, and it disappeared. The pieces of paper that I have flitting around here are beyond comprehension. Thank you. Okay. I move. All right. Karen, do you want to say anything about this, please? Um, so last year, um, we had worked out this historic preservation policy, and then COVID kind of hit. And at that same time, we were waiting for the historical commission to do, um, they had wanted a little bit more time. They have come back and said that they are in fully supportive of the uh, policy and I forwarded you that email. The policy has incorporated all the comments that the board members made last year and, um, and the comments that the Historic Commission had. They're in support of it. Um, I think that it's a good policy to adopt so that if any other projects come in that are hoping to reuse that has claim a public benefit for a historic building, this will help ensure that the board really gets what it wants to have from 
from the historic building. Okay, thank you. Um, before I read this motion, is there any discussion from the board? Um, I just had one comment on it and I'm, I'm looking for the copy of it now and I can't find it. I seem to recall reading through it that um, there's a section in there that says the, you know, a member from the historical society shall attend the planning board meeting. Mm -hmm. It's number four. That? Yep. You're right. Yeah. And um, it's, it's probably more technicality than anything else, but I don't, I don't know that um, uh, that we can sort of mandate that. Right. Um, I mean, we can invite the, the historical society to be present, um, but we can't, I don't think we can demand that they be present. Um, we don't have any sort of authority to do that. So I just wondered whether we should sort of re recraft that a little bit. How about if we said a member of the historical commission will be it invited? Recommended that, you know, it is recommended that a member of the historical commission attend, you know, the meeting or whatever. Okay. All right. Anything else? All right, I shall read this and then I'll get a second and we will open it up for further discussion after you hear what we're about to do. I move that the planning board adopt a standard policy for review of any project that proposes to provide public benefit through the preservation and or restoration of a building or structure for historic preservation purposes. One, any project subject to a special permit or site plan review, which is proposing to provide as a public benefit from the project, the historical preservation of buildings and or structures shall submit with their application the following. One, photographs of the existing condition of the historic buildings and or structures they are proposing as a historic preservation public benefit. Two, a description of the existing structure and its historic significance. Three, any information on the Massachusetts Cultural Resource Information System. Four, a narrative detailed description of the proposed work on the historic buildings and or structures, including all proposed interior and exterior work, collectively the historic preservation public benefit submittal. Two, the planning board will distribute a copy of the historic preservation public benefit submittal to the historic commission for review and comment. Three, the historic commission shall endeavor to provide written feedback to the planning board on the historic preservation public benefit submittal prior to the public meeting to discuss the submittal. A member of the historic commission is recommended to attend a planning board meeting to help determine the public benefit of the proposed historic preservation public benefit submittal. Should the planning board and historic commission agree that such public benefit is acceptable, the following steps would be required to finalize the specific public benefit or historical public benefit submittal. A, the proposed buildings and or structures shall be evaluated by a historic preservation consultant or historic architect as approved by the historical commission and planning board to determine and confirm the historical significance of a property. Example, see the evaluation of the Weatherboard, Weatherby House by Wendy Frontenero for 50 Country Way for an example of such an evaluation. The evaluation should consider whether the property conforms with the existing building code and or zoning and the specific positive impacts the preservation of the building will have to benefit the public. This evaluation review process will occur during the planning board public hearing meeting process for a historical preservation public benefit. All such input and public comment shall be delivered and reviewed by the planning board prior to issuing any decision on the project. All costs for us for third party consultants shall be paid for by the applicant. 
B, if the planning board decides that there is significant public benefit to the proposed historic preservation of the buildings and or structures, such building and or structures would be treated as if they were listed on the National Register of Historic Places and will therefore need to conform to the latest version of the U.S. Secretary of the Interior's guidelines for preservation found at HTTPS, www, NPS, government standards, treatment, et cetera, et cetera. C, as a condition of the planning board's approval of the proposed project with the approved public benefit, the applicant shall provide any necessary extensions for the issuance of a building permit in order that a final review of the documents can occur by a historic preservation consultant or historic architect that is approved by the planning board in consultation with the historic commission. The building commissioner, planning board and historical commission shall be given this information. The planning board shall appro approval shall be conditioned with the requirement that the building commissioner must have approval of the planning board and historical commission prior to issuance of a building permit. D, a final review of the historic preservation work by the applicant by a historic preservation consultant or historic architect will determine if the standards and treatment of guidelines were followed. This report must be reviewed and approved by the historical commission and the planning board prior to a certif certificate of occupancy being given for the historic public benefit structure. If conditions were not met, a meeting shall be held with the planning board, historical commission, the historical consultant, the building commissioner, and applicant to determine why and consequences. No certificate of occupancy shall be given until the public benefit has been met. E. The planning board will require a cash surety provided by the owner in an amount determined by the board based on the proposed work and public benefit in addition to other surety required for the project to be held by the town treasurer until the planning board and historical commission agree the public benefit is completed in accordance with the permit and a certificate of occupancy has been issued. Is there a second? Second. All right, further discussion? Anybody? Steve? No, I, I gave you my one comment and I think okay. we should proceed with it. All right, anybody else? No, okay. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. Ms. Barbine. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lampert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you, unanimous, all in favor. Thank you, people. Okay, our next item is planning and development report. Karen. All right, I have a couple items um, for tonight. Um, the first one is that um, the clubhouse at Seaside at Situate is asking for a temporary certificate of occupancy. Um, the inside of the clubhouse is done. It's all done for health, health safety. All those type of codes are met. On the exterior, um, the landscaping is not done and the bike rack is not in. You have a condition in the special permit that requires the bike rack to be installed prior to occupancy. Um, the reason why they really want to get into the clubhouse is because um, Tobos is running out of temporary uh, mailboxes. And so the, the mail room is the primary reason why they want to move into um, and get a temporary certificate with the clubhouse knowing that they still have to complete all the landscape and requirements. This is um, it's just for the clubhouse. It's not for the pool or anything um, beyond that. Just the immediate, really inside use of the clubhouse. I discussed this with Horsley Witten and they, they really don't have any objection to this um, because we still we still have a lot of work left to do on the project and they understand that they have to do this work 
and the clubhouse does not have any pervious pavement associated with it. I don't have any actual as built yet, but those will all be coming at the um, as we proceed further down the line. So I just wanted to check with the board. Does anybody have any objection if I sign off on a temporary um, CLO? Steve? Um, I guess I'm a little confused. You need a CFO to get a mailbox? <laughs> no, no, you don't need a CFO to get, but the, the clubhouse building has a mail room and in it is, is, is all the mailboxes for the project site because you wanted them all in, a, in one place. Uh -huh. Right now they're using temporary mailboxes and Toll Brothers has run out of um, the temporary mailboxes. They're in a couple of places couple places around the site, you know, um, and so. So how does also, the temporary occupancy permit fix that problem? Because the mail room will be functioning. The mail, the mail room, pe um, people can come to the clubhouse and get their mail. And it also has a secure package room. So it'll take away the, the, the temporary mailboxes outside, which are in a couple places around the site will uh -huh. be gone and then all mail will be received in one location and that's the um, clubhouse. And, and this location in the clubhouse, is the rest of the clubhouse sort of finished and it's- Yes, the rest of the clubhouse is finished, as, yes. a, as an occupied facility, because now that you have people going in there, it'll be used that way? I assume it'll be used that way as um, starting to be used that way. It, everything's done, they tell me, on the inside. Um, it's just, you know, the landscaping and uh, the pool, the pool is not done. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, like, and the bike rack is not installed, right? And the bike rack is not installed. Okay. They're planning on doing all that this um, spring. Okay. All right. Rebecca? I don't have a problem with it. Okay, Bob? I don't have a problem with it. Ben? I don't really have a problem with it. The only thing I guess would be in light of the current um, public health issues that we're facing is who's gonna assure that the CO on this clubhouse, like, is there a manager of the clubhouse? Are they gonna follow social distancing protocols? I mean, to me, it seems like temporary mailboxes are safer than having a bunch of 55 and over folks that are going to be, you know, there's going to be people skewed towards elderly, they're more at high risk. And now we're having them congregate or be, be kind of like funneled into one area for mail. So I just don't know how, what their protocol is on that, but that's obviously not necessarily in the purview of the planning board in terms of just the bike rack and landscaping, I guess I'm okay with the, the temporary CO. Okay, Patty? I'm okay with it. That's actually a pretty good sized room, if you recall. And it has a separate access that separates it from the clubhouse in general, right, Karen? I think now that you mentioned that, I think it did have a separate, um, a separate yeah. entrance. I mean, so that it would be secure. Yeah. Okay. I don't have a problem with that. No. Are they sort of, once we give them a temporary CO, they can open the whole thing. They're not limited to just opening the mail. No, that's that's correct. They they will open the whole thing. That's that's absolutely the intent. Well, I think Ben's um, points are well taken, and but then well, again, get more temporary mailboxes. There you go. Yeah, I'm just not sure that Ben's point is subject to the planning board jurisdiction. Right. I. You're right. Not in this rules. Yeah. And you, there's rules that are out there, like they're, right. that they'll need to be following. I can't find anything, you know, I can't, I don't know if you even tried to get additional temporary mailboxes, but it feels to me like they're using that as an excuse to get the full CO to open the clubhouse. No, it'll so, only be a temporary CO for the time being. Yeah, but it, temporary it, it, the COs are are permanent, pretty much. I, I, I understand. I, that's, yes, I understand that. So we're waiting on what, um, uh, 
what don't they have that you would give a full one for? It's the bike rack? They don't have the bike rack per your the special permit decision. The landscape is not, the landscaping is not done. I haven't received an as built. And no, I haven't received seems kind of important, but yes. the, um, I haven't received the every unit, every all the units give an as built and a certification that everything was done according to the drainage is all done according to the plan. And that has not been received. Um, the building department has a foundation as built, but you know, I haven't received the as built for the clubhouse. Well, based on that, I would be um, hesitant to give them one until we get an ass built. But they can't do the whole ass built till all the stuff is yeah, done. But, well, like Steve says, they'll have to get more mailboxes, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, just what? Just so the so when you yeah. you're saying you guys seem more familiar to this with this, but when you're saying temporary, how long does that last? Uh, you're saying Forever. temporary much permit yeah permit. i think a temporary co can only last for six months yeah but, but they would they would anticipate having <laughs> they they would have anticipate having the the full as built um the full all the everything completed um they anticipate that this summer so within six months could i make a suggestion what, since we know that there is a separate entrance into this mail room, why not tell them they can only use the mail room, they can't use the rest of the clubhouse until everything else is done? And that resolves the issue of the temporary mailboxes and keeps the horde out of the main portion of the building until you get the as builds. As long as you can qualify a TCO that way, that would be okay with me. I'm not sure you can qualify a TCO yeah. that way, but I will, I'll, I'll have to ask tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. All right, short of that, do we want to grant a temporary or do we want to wait? I, I, I say, you know, Karen's ability to get all the things done that need to get done diminish tremendously once you issue a TCO. I mean, once once people are in, you're not going to drag them out. Um, <laughs> you no, know, it's no, you're not. It, no. It's possession is nine tenths at that point, right? And um, and you know, Karen, I I know you've been riding herd on this the whole way, but you know, if if you think you still feel comfortable that you can get everything you need and get get people to be responsive, that's one thing. Um, but, you know, you're sort of giving up the leverage to make sure you get all the things that people had promised. And we know how well they promise things. Well, maybe we could leave it that if they can get a temporary occupancy for the mail room, and that's it. And if you can't get that, then get more mailboxes. Karen, what's your feeling on it? Will it, will it, hinder your ability to get out what else you need. I mean, I think they're going to, they're definitely going to do the landscaping. I mean, that I know they're going to do that. And they absolutely know about the bike rack because I've been yeah. harping on the bike rack. And, and it, they, they are, can't do any of that this time of year. So they can, they, they, they can, can do they the bike rack. Yeah, they, they can't do the, the landscaping. Rack. They put in buffer. They put in the buffer down by uh, at the end of phase two, and they put and by the phase two area, they put they planted buffer in late December, early January. Yeah. But, but it's they not obviously now are going to wait for around the clubhouse and any of the more units now that we have snow they're going to wait till april that's that's the grand plan that i've been told i think that we are holding surety and they just you know won't get you know they won't get any more surety back well then should we just leave it to karen's discretion 
as to whether or not they get their temporary CO. I can, I can live with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Me too. All right, Steve. Yeah, I think that's fine. Um, All right. You know, just, just make sure you leave yourself some leverage, Karen. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right, Bob. I agree. All right, and Ben. Yep. All Sounds right. fine to me. All right, there you go. That's done. All right. So the next um, thing that I wanted to report on is that um, in on in two weeks, February twenty fifth, um, the P zoning board of appeals is going to be hearing um, a section six finding for uh, one mill wharf. They want to um, add, they want to, re the theater is going, not going to go back in there. Um, they want to replace the theater with four condos and 900 square feet of retail space. Um, <laughs> uh, four condos and 900 square feet of retail space. Um, they, and they've applied for a section six finding for it. And um, I would recommend that we at least write a comment letter that site plan review is going to be required because it is a change in use. Yeah, did, is that, was that done under a special permit? No. No, that was done from the planning board under site plan review because they went back in 2001, they went and got a section six finding to do what was done there anyways, to reduce the size of the theater to what, what it has been and do um, the 20, I think it was 28 condo units with you know 30 parking spaces and 54 bedrooms. That was under section six finding too. So it's, a, it's eliminating retail use on the first floor and replacing it with residential. And is right. that allowed in that district? Yeah, that's what I would say. Um, I think it's allowed in the districts. Hmm. Condos are essentially um, like single family units. But wasn't the whole point yeah. of retail the Harbor on. District to have retail on the first floor and then your residences up above? So how can you have four condos on the first floor and 900 square feet of retail? Should it all be retail or are they putting another floor on, what are they doing? No, if they're not putting another floor. They're just, they're, I mean, it looks like the plans look like they're just taking the first floor and discontinuing the theater use and putting four condos um, towards the front part of that space and having um, retail in the back. Oh, how interesting. Hmm. And is the retail going to be about the size as the uh, known as right now? Is that what they're leaving? I don't even think it's that big. It's 900 square feet. And that, I mean, I can, I can send you that all, as as that. I can send you all what we, what we received from the ZBA. Um, I can work out, I can write a comment letter and then forward it around to you all and see if you like the comment letter. I think the comment letter basically has to say that planning board review of this project is required. Well, Which it is. Yeah, I think as a minimum, we should say that. It's just, it feels like, um, and I don't know the commitments that were made back when, but it feels like the whole thing was set up as sort of a, a, a mixed use development with retail on the first. So this is the first step to, you know, are the rest of the retail units ultimately going to become residential? Oh, good point. Oh, good point. Where are they supposed to park? Well, that's the other issue. 
Well, they're asking, they're basically, the argument is that um, it's less demand on parking than the theater parking. Uh, okay, but I, the theater comes and goes in an hour. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> Residential has overnight parking, right? Yeah, right. It comes and goes in two hours. Okay. Well, so the, the, re the parking would be in Cole Parkway. But I there's not. You, I will send <laughs> you the information. I, I will send you the information that we received from the zoning board, and I'll take a stab at something, and, and then we can go from there. One of the things with the other 28 units, because they do not have enough specified parking, that they were parking in the Welsh company parking lot. Mm -hmm. Then it would seem to me that if they go forward with these additional units, those people should also park in the Welsh company parking lot. Because theoretically, there is no overnight parking in Cole Parkway. Or has that changed? Plus the fact that it floods. A lot. Yes. Well, so does their designated parking. I can speak from experience. On that. Yes, it does. <laughs> it all floods. Uh, Ugh. Well, it definitely require. I think requires a review because it's change in use. Um, right, change in use. Mm -hmm. um, I'll send you the information, and you, you can see what they have supplied. And I will also dig out the site plan review from two thousand and one that the planning board um, approved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, All righty. All right, so then. Um, and you'll draft at least the, the outline of a letter? I'll put together an outline of a letter and get it out to you. And just knowing that they won't pay any attention to us, but we can try. All right, so I will also put together an outline of a letter. Um, we also got a, we got, um, a notification that an ENF was um, submitted to MEPA um, on February 1st for the MBTA to reduce for reduction in service, um, which is, you know, directly contradictory to smart growth and this new housing initiative. And I'm going to, I'll put together a comment. I don't know if, if I have to talk to the administration to see if it's going to come from the TA or if the planning board um, wants to give a comment. Can you send us the ENF? I don't have the ENF. I just have a letter. Oh, it, it's somewhere on the secretary's website, right? Yeah. It, it should be, but that information wasn't up the other day when I looked. Oh. And they don't give you the whole ENF on the secretary's website. I know a few people up there. I'll send, I'll send the letter that we received and um, I'll, you know, I'll keep looking, but um, okay. so then that brings us to the, um, this housing initiative, you know, um, it, it is the first time in like 45 years that there's been a change to 40A. And like I said, it's for an MBTA community and you have to have at least one reasonably sized district in which multifamily is permitted as of right. And each district shall have a minimum gross density of 15 units per acre, subject to you know, further limitations imposed by uh, section 40 of chapter 131 in title five. Um, and so I did forward this document to you. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I just don't know what the board's thoughts are on if you wanted to have it apply to all the VCNs, um, potentially just Greenbush, potentially just North Situate. Um, town Council and I kind of went roundabout on this today. Um, town Council and I kind of, I we think that there's room 
in the existing legal ad that we did for North Situate to change the number to 15 because we just said revise the table. Um, yes, the, the information already submitted to the town clerk says 12, but we can resubmit a page to say 15. But the board hasn't had a chance to discuss this. Um, another, I sent you another um, municipal alert dated February 5th from Murphy, Humi, um, Hesse, Toomey, and Lahane. And this is where we, it talked about certain ordinance or bylaws and whether they're going to, what types of votes they're going to need. And um, the act, it, it, it's, it's not clear yet to town council if our requirement for this with the North Situate zoning, if that would be, because it is multifamily by right, if it would be just a majority vote at town meeting or a two thirds vote because of the way we have it written. We don't have it currently at the 15 units. And, and just, I have not read this thing yet, Karen, but what, what's the ramification if we don't have that? You can't apply for certain grants. So, oh. um, so you can't apply for any, uh, okay, housing choice initiative grants, as is local capital projects fund or mass works infrastructure. So you can't apply for certain grants until um, it says that the guidance says that all MBTA communities will be deemed in compliance until more specific guidance is developed and made available to MBTA communities. Hmm. So, I mean, I think we're, 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 we're largely there with the, with the current VCN and the proposed VCN, but it's just, some fine tuning that we have to review in the next, you know, in the next, you know, two weeks to determine um, what actually is happening. Because in the municipal alert from Murphy, you know, Murphy Hesse, it says special permit requirements. The act also provides that a special permit may be issued by a simple majority of the special permit granting authority rather than the otherwise two thirds supermajority for the following projects. Multifamily housing within half a mile of an MBTA station, if at least 10% of the units are affordable for at least 30 years. Now, I'm not really reading that in the, in the directive that came from DHCD. So, I'm not 100% where Murphy Hesse got that. Hmm. And so that was part of the um, roundabout that I had with Cindy today. And, you know, that's why she wanted us to continue the hearings. Yeah. To, let's figure out where we are, what's impacted, and where maybe this 10% of the affordable units came from. Because right now, if you take a look at our zoning, you can do up to 12 units by right for multifamily within a half mile, and we're within a half mile of the MBTA, both Greenbush and North Situate. Mm -hmm. But yet, once you hit eight units, you need, you need affordable housing. And that was, that's under the current bylaw. Yeah. That's not even with the change. With the and change, that, it's gonna go down to five, right? That's correct. Well, right, once you need six units. And that was six kind units. of, you know, 
we kind of got a little stuck there today. All right, I think that we all need to think about this and hopefully do some research. If, you, if anybody still has um, the globe, there was a, a good article in the business section about housing choice and they cited Arlington with some issues. And I, I think it's worth a read so that when we come back in two weeks, we can figure out where we're gonna go and how we're gonna get there. I mean, so one of the other things I just want to say, it's um, it was talking about amendments to zoning ordinance or bylaws that allow for multifamily housing or mixed use developments in the eligible location, accessory dwelling units, or open space residential development as of right. I discussed with Cindy, well, we don't have, we have flexible open space and that's, that's not by right. Our, none of our accessory dwelling units are by right. It's all by special permit. Mm -hmm. And it's really, we allow multifamily, you know, by right in, in the VCN, unless you exceed the density. So like Ann said, if everyone can think about it, and if you can't, I mean, if you need me to resend the two pieces of it, literature, I can resend them along with the uh, letter from the um, Mass, Mass DOT on the Would ENF. You, uh, just put it all in one email, that'd be helpful. Okay, I'll do, I'll do that tomorrow. I just sent you a copy of the, also the copy of the MBTA service okay. reduction ENF. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, people. Uh, Karen, do you have anything else that we need to talk about? No, I think that's where we are. We remain busy. We with the, uh, you know, um, accessory dwellings, etc. And next time we will also be having a public hearing on the fee schedule. Which we which is long overdue, mm -hmm. this right, fee schedule. Long, over, long, long overdue. overdue. All right. Does anybody have anything else that they would like to add before we? Oh, just you... Rebecca, if you can come in sometime to sign the decision <coughs> for 4852. You. Thank you. Okay. All right, people, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Ms. Barbine. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lampert. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you, unanimous. All in favor? We are adjourned. Good night, all. Good night. Happy, Bye. Val Bye. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Another Hallmark moment. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye. 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 <sighs> oh, Kate. Seth, do you need anything? You're good? Everyone's good? We're good. Oh, excellent. Do, were we on Facebook tonight? I'm sorry, hold on. We still are. <laughs>